Today we're going to continue in our series in the uh, book of Hosea. We'll be looking at chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, and the title is Avoiding God. When God points sin out in our lives and announces his plan to punish us, unrepentant man tries to avoid him. And that's what we're going to see as Hosea lays out his cause. First, Hosea is talking to the priests and the rulers and the people of God, and he says in summation that they're all guilty. They're all guilty of not following God. The judge applies this case to the accused, and he condemned the leaders for trapping innocent people and exploiting them. The leaders of the country, the priests and the king, were exploiting the people. They trapped them in an exploitation relationship and, and were causing them to turn from God themselves. There was no justice in the land. They were sinking deep in sin and lacked the proper perspective on how they were to live because they did not any longer know the Lord. And their arrogance was only leading them to stumble and fall. So God withdrew himself from them and he stayed back and the people couldn't feel the presence of God in their lives anymore. And they began to forget God even more and turn more and more to the idols for deliverance from famine, for deliverance from injustice, for deliverance from armies that would come against them. And then God pronounces his sentence upon them and he says, you're not going to exist any longer. You're going to be devoured just as a lion devours its prey. And then he sends a warning to Judah and says, you're not too far behind Israel. Your corruption is there too, but your corruption is going to take a little bit longer. It's going to be like rotting wood. It takes longer, but the destruction is still the same. Israel and Judah were weak nations. But instead of turning to the Lord, they turned to the king of Assyria, thinking that the king of Assyria would give them an alliance that would keep them strong and keep them protected. But God allowed that to turn against them. And they were rather, Israel was taken into captivity and in subjection. And there in subjection and in captivity, they cried out to God. And God didn't leave them forever abandoned because he gave them their, his word. And his word gave them hope. And eventually, that captivity would end and God would restore. Let's see what Hosea actually did say to the people. And then we'll look at what his word means for us today. He says this, Hear this, you priests. Pay attention, you Israelites. Listen, O royal house. This judgment is against you. A net spread out on Tabor. The rebels are deep in slaughter. I will discipline all of them. I know all about Ephraim. Israel is not hidden from me. Ephraim, you have now turned to prostitution. Israel is corrupt. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart, and they do not acknowledge the Lord. Israel's arrogance testifies against them. The Israelites, even Ephraim, stumble in their sin. Judah also stumbles with them. When they go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, they will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. They are unfaithful to the Lord. They give birth to illegitimate children. Now their new moons and festivals will devour them and their fields. God announces his verdict in verses 1 through 7. He announces his verdict to the people the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. And the first thing he says is, priests, you are guilty. Then he says, king, you are guilty. Rather than being the beacons of leadership, the beacons of light, leading the people into a proper relationship with God, they hitched their wagons to the idols. And they began to worship the idols and began to look away from God for their deliverance and for their safety. And in so doing, they brought compromise into their rulership as king and their rulership as priests, and they sent the people on a path of destruction. They didn't listen to God's directives anymore. They didn't listen to God's laws anymore. They only listened to the things and did the things that fit their own needs for power. 
And this led the people down the path of destruction. And the people followed. So God said, people, you're guilty too. God reveals the base sins of Israel in these verses. He says, by word and flesh, they slaughtered others. Within the nation, they were killing each other. They were killing each other with slander, and they were killing each other by the sword, and there was bloodshed throughout the nation. The rule of law wasn't being upheld because it all depended upon how much money you had as to what you could get away with. They sell themselves to the other gods, the small g gods, the idols, the balls that were in the high places. They would take their sacrifices there and expect these gods of wood and stone to help them, to give them fertility, to give them crops, to give them livestock, to give them protection. They no longer were acknowledging God. They were only acknowledging the idols. They weren't going to Jerusalem to worship in the temple because the king had set up alternate places of worship saying, you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. You can worship right here in our land. They were a prideful people. And they began to think, we can take care of ourselves. We know how to deal with things. We don't need God. And they began to forget about God. And they were unfaithful to him. Okay. That was nice for them. God's coming down against them. God's talking to them. How's this passage talk to us? Well, in the same way it spoke to them. God reveals our base sins today as a nation and as it trickles down into our individual lives. Look at how we're killing each other. There's stories about mass shootings and individual shootings across this country on a daily basis. The FBI tells us that violent crime is down in Pittsburgh. You wouldn't know that by living there. People are getting shot all the time. Two weeks ago, somebody was murdered out front of our house. Well, eventually, yeah. But right then, uh, the one person was shot when Nancy came home. She had to make her way to the house because of all the police tape. Somebody died right there on the spot. The other person died in the hospital. They still haven't caught him. We have shootings in Pittsburgh, and we're, Pittsburgh's a small city. Some even would say it's really not a city. If you come from Chicago and New York and Los Angeles, Pittsburgh isn't much. But you hear about killings here out in Indiana as well. People are just taking things into their own hands. We have a new shooting just this past week on a college campus. We're doing the same thing. The rule of law is being forgotten. People are doing it for different reasons, but they're still doing it. Look at how we sell ourselves to gain money, power, or sex. Let's look at it. It's out there. All the advertising that's out there. All the drive that people have. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more money. I want more power. I want more toys. I want more this. We're doing the same thing as a country. We want more. We want more. Look at how this country is trying to erase the image of God. Ten Commandments on school property. Got to go. Ten Commandments at town hall. Got to cover it up so nobody can see them. And then, just this past week, it was ordered that it be removed. Even the covered up monument had to be removed and taken someplace else. Crosses on... on government land that has been leased, legally leased, and a cross put up, are being taken down because people want to forget about God. People want to erase the image of God. Caricature in, on Facebook the other day, talking about that killing in the school. One of the characters is saying, why didn't God do anything about that killing in this school? And the other character says, how could he? He's not allowed on school property. You know, we're trying to erase the image of God from our country. Gee, sounds familiar. What was going on in Israel? Look at the pride of our nation that says we can do it without God. We don't have to consult with God. We can do it. We're smart enough. We know how to do it. We can do it by ourselves. Sounds familiar. 
Look at how people in this country only give lip service to God. How many times do you hear it on the news or do you hear it at the end of a speech? God bless America, spoken by people who don't even believe in the Word of God. Who don't even want to believe in the Word of God, let alone obey the Word of God. How different are we from Israel? So do you think this passage speaks to us? I do. We need to wake up. We can't do it without God. This country's going to fall without God. Democracy fails without an ultimate standard. Without the ultimate standard that God has set, democracy will fail because people will still clamor to have what they want regardless of what anybody else has. I want it my way. I want it my way. And unless there's an ultimate standard that says, no, this is where it stops, democracy will fail. It'll eventually turn into anarchy. And then from anarchy, it'll turn into dictatorship because that's the only way to get control again. We're feeling the effects of God's judgment on our country even today. Look at the way we're falling apart. Look at the way, look at the way across this nation Things that God says are sin, people say, Psh, it's okay. Nothing's happening to us. We can do these things. After all, I can do whatever I want to do as long as I'm not hurting somebody else. Men and women today are doing what's right in their own eyes. And God in his word repeatedly says, when man starts doing what's right in his own eyes, destruction will come. Destruction comes to individual lives. Destruction comes to marriages. Destruction comes to family. Destruction comes to government. Many people turn to God only as last resort. 9-11 hit. The church is filled up. People were praying. Because people saw the potential of the judgment of God and they were turning to him as last resort. There's a story about a, a ship Back in the 50s, crossing the Atlantic, they hit an iceberg, and the ship was going down, and the captain put it across the loudspeaker, telling the people to pray. He said, pray, pray, pray. And one lady came up to the captain and said, is that what we've come to? Meaning, there's no other hope except God give us a miracle? God was seen as a last resort to their needs, not as the first resort. And that's the way people in this country are treating God. We'll do it our way until it doesn't work, and then we'll say, God, get us out of our mess. Sometimes God will. But sometimes he lets us go down, just like he let Israel go down into captivity before he rescues them back out or rescues us back out. When we treat God like a life insurance policy or a fire extinguisher, something that's only there in case we need it, God doesn't always respond very quickly. And sometimes he says, oh, well, that fire extinguisher's out of order. <laughs> you know, you have to wait. After the smoke clears, then I'll help you pick up the pieces. Then God announces his punishment in verses 8 through 12. He basically tells them, you're going to get wiped out. Israel, you're going to get wiped out just like a lion goes after its prey. It's going to be quick and it's going to be sudden and you're going to be wiped out. You're no longer going to be a nation. And then he sends word down to Judah too, saying, you guys are too. It's just going to talk, take longer. You're like rotting wood. Eventually you'll crumble, but not right now. So he announces his punishment. He says, first he says, in verses 8 through 12, he talks the analogy of a moth. A moth seems innocuous, but let a moth get into your closet and you have a nice expensive wool piece of clothing. It doesn't take too long, just overnight. And that piece of wool clothing can be ruined unless you got mothballs there. But in our country, it's like the story of the man who bought mothballs and then came back returning them to the shop owner saying these don't work. He says, what do you mean they don't work? He says, I stayed up all night throwing these mothballs at the moths 
and they still ate my clothes. And he says, you're not using them right. And that's the way we treat God. We say, God do this for me, God do this for me, God do this for me, and God's saying, it's a relationship here. I'm not a genie in a bottle. If you treat me like a genie in a bottle, it's not going to work. Judah's going to have its reckoning day. But they're going to be like the wood that rots away. It'll take a while longer. But they were going to be overcome as well. Because Assyria, the king of Assyria, was going to attack them and destroy them as well. And after God tells them all of this, what are the response of the leaders of the Israelites? What's the response of the nation of Israel? They said, oh, God says we're going to be in trouble. God says we're going to get overrun. Hosea is telling us God's going to bring judgment and we're going to get overtaken. So let's go to the king of Assyria and get an alliance with him and he'll protect us. <laughs> they didn't turn to God. They turned to their own means. And it ended up that the king of Assyria was the one that God was going to use to take them into captivity. So they went and they decided to play around with the enemy rather than talking with God and following God. They ignored God until destruction was upon them. Then they cried out, save us! And God said, no, you got to go away for a while. But I'm going to leave you with my word. And my word tells you that you're my chosen people. And my word tells you that the story's not done. That I'm still going to be there for you. I'm going to stay in covenant with you. And it gave the remnant hope. And the remnant held on. Praise God that even though Israel was taken into captivity, God was with them in captivity. And the remnant was able to maintain. And God resurrected the remnant and brought them out. In the same way, today, people shows, uh, God shows us his favor. Our nation, our country, has more Bible capacity. We have more Bibles and more ability to access Bibles than any place else in the world. So as we're coming up against that destruction and people start crying out, God's just going to say, look at the word that I left you. There's a promise in there. I promise to save those who call upon my name and who believe in me and I'll take you to heaven. He said, but you might have to go through some pain and suffering first because you weren't being true to me. But God has given us his word. He shows us how Christ is the answer for our sins, how Christ can pick us up when we sin, how when we receive him, receive his forgiveness for our sins he can give us the strength and he can give us the power to overcome sin in our lives he can keep us from sinning and he can help us walk in the light as he is in the light so God won't abandon us even though our country seems to be in the same shape that Israel was God saying I'm leaving you with my word even if your leaders are taking you down the wrong path even if your spiritual leaders are taking you down the wrong path. He says, my word is still available to you. We just look at our country. Look at where our leaders are taking us. We're making pacts and treaties with the enemies of God. <laughs> How's that going to work? How's that going to turn out? People who vow to destroy we're saying, let's make a deal. Better to do this deal knowing that they're going to get the power to destroy us than to go to war right now on my watch. Hmm, interesting. How about the religious leaders that we have? Ah, oh, yeah, God will let anybody into his heaven. Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. God didn't really mean that, you know? God, God didn't really mean not to do that. God just, yeah, it's okay if you do it. God still loves you because God is love. He loves everybody. Everybody will get into his heaven. Hell's just a scare tactic. It's not real. God's going to let everybody in. You can hear that a lot over the TV and over the radio today. And it's not true. Because God says there's only one way, and it's my way. And I want everybody to follow my way, but if you don't, you don't get in. Not to my heaven. You'll get into Satan's hell. 
the majority of the people have begun to follow those leaders, the political and the religious. And God promises destruction for those who disobey him. But he's also given us a promise. 2 Corinthians 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So the questions before each one of us, will I, will you, commit to turning from my wicked ways, whether you think my ways are wicked or not? I know I've got stuff in my life that I need to turn over to God. Might, not be, imp not, but might be big things compared to somebody else, but they're big enough that God says, I've got to do it. What about you? Are you willing to make that commitment to him? A bonfire is created as one piece of wood catches fire and ignites another piece of wood on fire until all the wood is blazing. And that's what God wants us to be. One piece catching another piece on fire until the world is set ablaze for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Will you let God make you be that piece of wood that'll catch somebody else on fire for the kingdom of God? It's when we humble ourselves and we confess our sins and pray, God will bring healing to us. And as we do it as individuals and collectively, he'll bring healing to our nation. But it takes one individual touching another individual touching another individual and today God's saying will you be the one individual that starts it off let's pray Father thank you for your love and thank you for your word your word is so relevant for us today you gave warnings to Israel and they said ah I'm not listening and you showed in your word that your prophecies and your truth would come true. Those same warnings are going out to us today. Our nation is following in the ways of Israel. Individuals are following in the way of Israel. And Lord, you've promised to bring destruction if we don't change our ways. Give us the strength as individuals to yield to you, to change our ways even if it's just the small incremental ways that will last for the rest of our lives. We build upon that, Lord. You're not asking us to change our lives dramatically and drastically this moment because that's impossible apart from you doing it. But you want us to partner with you and make these little incremental changes that will stay, that will last so that our spiritual health would increase and you could use us in the lives of others to help them make changes until our country is ablaze with people who worship you and serve you. Make me that person today. Make each of us that person today so that we can be used of you for your glory and for your honor, bringing light into darkness and seeing souls saved for the kingdom of God. If we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's greet one another.